All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to EOF Implementer Call number 54. It is the 24th of July, 2024. Um, right now, our agenda is uh, mostly standard. We have client updates, um, compiler updates, a couple open questions on spec updates. What should we do about detecting contracts? Um, then uh, probably longer talk on testing updates. Um, and fuzzing will be part of that. And then finally, another uh, item, if we have time, is to talk about DevCon talks. They're due next week. Um, proposals that I want to give us an opportunity to collaborate if we want to set some things up for it or if we just want to individually submit to it. It's up to us. Um, so the first topic is uh, client updates. Um, Peter, do you want to talk about EVM1 and Aragon3 real quick? Uh, as for EVM1, I, I think we are up to spec. There was one, one bug fix on, on the way by Pavo, and, and that's it, I guess. Andre, can you correct me? I was out for a for part of the week, so I'm not sure. Yeah, nothing else. We, all the spec is implemented. Yep. Okay. Um, never mind. Uh, updates? Uh, yeah, the spec is implemented, all tests passing. Cool. Now the fun part happens. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, Dragon, Rath? Um, uh, we had one bug. We didn't increment nonce if the validation fails. That's fixed. And I am making uh, basically finishing the PR that takes into account if the bytecode uh, it takes into, into account uh, container type. And with that, uh, we finish off the validation tests. Okay. Um, I'll go for Besu. Um, we had one bug with the EXT code stuff in Legacy. Uh, we needed a. We were not applying it to older um, forks properly, so we got that fixed. And um, it's not a. Yeah, it's because of the rules. There's nothing you could do with it. It's more of a defense and depth fix. But that was something that Guido found in his fuzzing work. Um, so that was that was a good find there. Um, JavaScript, ETHJS. Anyone from ETHJS? Anyone from EELS? Anyone from Geth? I have a PR out to Geth. Um, they had the same issue we had with the XD call ordering. I'll, I'll ping Marius again and try and get that merged into his his code. Um, they also still have that bug also in reverse jumpy based on the last time I checked their code. Um, were there any clients I missed? Okay. Compilers, I'm not seeing any of our compiler people on the call. I'm not seeing Daniel or Charles. Any compiler updates? Any updates on the uh, Solidity POC? OK, so moving on. Um, spec updates. We still have an open question about how we're going to solve the contract detection issue. This is something um, Solidity uh, pointed out to us when we first did the POC, um, as far as checking to see if a contract exists before doing a call, that's something Solidity does as a user experience feature. But also more importantly, it impacts um, EIP 721, where they have specific uh, protocols in their e safe transfer from mechanism that depends on being able to detect if a contract is an EOA or not, and they detect that by the size of the code. Um, so there were two options that we discussed. One was to reuse EXT code size and morph that into an is contract opcode. And the other one is extending call values from EXT call. And there may have been a third one that I forgot about. Um, yeah, that was passing, a passing the flux into the EXT call. Oh, uh, uh, passing flags into the call or doing a check flag on the, on the output. Correct. OK. Um, if we're going to fix this in 1.0, we probably need to address this sooner rather than later, especially if it's going to be a return code change. 
Uh, ben? Doesn't EX code size work anyway because it's not zero bytes? It's like two bytes. Or something. It's two bytes, but we can't use the XT code size inside of the EOF contracts. Uh, okay. But it would work this is... outside of. Um... Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, EOF smart contract wallet could accept it. So is there any strong opinion as to what the best solution to this might be? Uh, Powell, I see your off mute. And he's back on mute. Sorry, I don't have. You're not I mean, having good luck with. Changing. Go ahead, yeah, then. Changing X code size seems sensible. The, the common pattern for um, Legacy is EXC code size and then is zero. Um, but then obviously have to be writing something different for EOF. Um, so probably work. Paul, is your mic working? Yeah, I believe this, uh, but I, I, I'm out of the context right now, so I don't have anything to say in this topic. Okay. To me, it seems like this contract kind of a code is the simplest to agree on, simplest to figure out the spec, because the rest, the other options are like too many options to choose from, and none of them seem ideal. Okay. Um, it looks like I didn't. I thought I'd submitted a PR possibly to thirty five four. So if we do a spec change, the question is, which EIP should it be in? Um, and I think it would be thirty five forty, because that's where the other handling of the XD code is handled. Or do we create a new EIP at a cover is contract, or do we put it in? the the call op code what are people's opinions on the best place for it uh, just just before we do that um are we or how much are we concerned about the uh, um the response of uh, another op code being touched in a way i mean does it count as a new op code or not um yeah it probably does I mean, I mean which the data thing. copy it's... doesn't, so maybe it doesn't. It's a new name. Um, is ex code size disallowed? In... It's not just. It still runs, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, as of now, it is. It's it's not allowed in EOS. Okay, maybe we need a test for that. <laughs> oh, we should. I think we have. Somewhere. No, I'm not sure why this code's working. We do. <laughs> there is a banned and permitted opcode test that goes through every single opcode. Yep. Huh. My red herring code isn't, can't find it. <laughs> um, but I mean, and that's also another point is that we could introduce this in, in a future um, fork and just add an opcode because adding opcodes is still fine instead of the OF. But I mean, it, it could do exactly the same as it does in legacy, I returning T for EOF and returning the length for legacy. And then normal code would still work. Returning the length goes against, uh, I mean, it, it allows code introspection, right? But it doesn't allow introspection of EOF code. Any of uh, yeah, oh, just the size also. Yeah, any of legacy code. Sounds interesting. However, um, it is. 
but it then is clear. No, but then nobody need to change the pattern. The, it would still work. Otherwise, Solidity might need to go, oh, what are you doing here? Um, you know, you're checking code length. Um, I need to convert this into an is contract call. Yeah, I think Solidity is aware and they said they are okay with using whatever method this contract would work to They're like changing this code anyway for UF. Yeah, but I mean if if users in Solidity are doing their own, you know, they're using Open Zeppelin or whatever to do contract length greater than zero. And then Solidity won't have, won't, have to, won't have to reinterpret it. No, query and contract length is not uh, available at all in the web. So these, of course, would not work. Isn't yeah. the current suggestion we're talking about to, to re enable Xcode sites? Yeah, and just return. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, then I agree then that's the issue for Solidity users and in general, I. Not sure it's a great approach to have different semantic like in legacy in UF and you um, know. it'd be the same. It would be the same, right? Right. The target would be would yeah. UF versus legacy would be different for the target, but not for the source of the call. Right? Right. I like that's a subtle. I didn't hadn't thought of that. I really like the subtlety of that. Because we have the same opcode between legacy and EOF, because what we're concerned about for code introspection is introspecting into EOF code. And we could view, and this also opens up um, using other legacy contracts as data contracts. Um, does, you know, in a future version of EOF, we could unban EXT code copy and EXT code hash. But I think we start with just EXT code size and yeah. keep it the same behavior so that EOF comes across as two and is otherwise a distinguishable from a link to contract that's not EOF. So what we don't have is an EOF detector, which I don't think there's a valid use case for right now. Right, we would have well, it with the hash, expose, expose hash, but we, we don't need it, I guess. Do we? In the previous call, we talked about the delegate call uh, restriction oh, no. that I was proposing to lift and access proposed to keep the restriction, but add a way to detect EOF. Again, I still prefer just lifting the restriction, but that was one use case for adding EOF detection. I mean, we would need to lift code hash because the code hash is consistent and we wouldn't have to open up the door of copying other contract code. That's true. I mean, that still doesn't, might not count as code introspection. You can just check the hash. On the other hand, lifting the restriction for delegate call seems like opening up a very easy path to working around code introspection in general, because you can delegate call and their call gas, call copy, code copy, or whatever. Yeah, and, and you can just, to do code copy of a legacy contract, you just call a jumper contract and have code copy there. Sorry, say again, I think, catch that. So, so the ban of these three yeah, EXT no. opcodes is very easy to circumvent. You just have another contract yeah. that takes one argument of the stack, executes it and returns it. It's super easy to circumvent with, with legacy in place. Is that an argument for enabling these these opcodes in EOF context? Kind of is. Because it's not, I think what's different between this and, this, and the delegate call and self-destruct is we're not modifying account state. And I think that was the big issue with self-destruct is we were allowing non-EOF code to change things on the account state. Um, EXT copy, EXT size, and EXT hash uh, just provide data. They don't change the state of the account 
like a, a pay op code or um, a create op code. And really self-destruct was the only effective one to like remove code. And that's since been removed. But as a category, I could see future account changes uh, being proposed. And I honestly think there are times where we might want just EOF to have access to those as well. So maybe we might need a band delegate call into EOF. I don't know. Or we would need a check on the operation that we're working on an account that has EOF code. But that's, I think that's a bridge we can cross when we get there um, with the account changes. Um, but just banning a, a value read op code is trivial to circumvent. Can you say that again about uh, the delegate call thing? So currently there's a restriction in one direction, but not in the other direction. And you were, you were just making an argument for banning it in both directions, right? Right. So we, we're not there right now, but if there was a feature in EOF that allowed the EOF account to be manipulated in some way, like set a, um, set a 7702 delegate or unset it, and it only had it in EOF, then legacy would just delegate call in the EOF to get at it and do that call. Um, so, you know, EOF only things in modified account kind of don't matter because you can, with delegate call into an EOF, and the thing is we can't ban delegate calls in the EOF because that's going to remove a lot of utility for things like Uniswap. So I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing on features that don't exist yet. And it's kind of an argument for why those features should not exist. If we allow uh, account changes, it should be available to legacy and um, EOF. But if we're trying to keep things out of the world, get rid of these account changes like self-destruct, then we can't let EOF call legacy because that would bring those back into the EOF accounts. And that was um, self-destruct and the sweep operate the basically the sweep operation uh, of, of the balance of the ether is what remains in self-destruct. That's something that we're trying to get rid of um, as a whole. And the getting rid of the deleting the storage in the code um, was a compromise to make Verkle work. But it still has some side effects that we're still trying to keep from entering EOF if we can. that there are no features that manipulate accounts that are EOF only, and I don't think there will be. Is pay really legacy only? Is what? Pay, the, the new self pay. pay is right now legacy only, yes. But I mean, is it, isn't it, are you not able to get the same behavior on EOF? Not right now. You can't do an unconditional sweep ball balance at the end of the transaction. Um, and that's, it's a, yeah, because uh, self-destruct interacts strangely with um, the call stack as well. Um, so pay is not really, self-destruct is not really pay. Um, there is a legit pay proposal that has different semantics. I would call it the new self-destruct, the 6780 self-destruct. The 6780 self-destruct is not in EOF. Got it. So were there any arguments against removing the ban on EXT code operations? What's the strongest arguments we have against it? I mean, you mean all three or just the two ones that we are? Which, yeah, there's, there's, there's two options. There's all three and there's just size. And, um, and size and, I, and hash, right? Oh yeah, size, size, size and hash, size, hash and code copy. Right, and size is needed for the solidity case. The NF, um, NFT or what, what I think that was ERC721. Yeah, then... anyone that tries to distinguish between whether they're setting to uh, an EOA yeah. or a smart yeah. contract. And then hash is needed for what Franchise is uh, the case, um, making the case for, which is to, to make it easier to ex delegate call without. Like with yes. more predictable result, right? More or less. Yes. But we have no case for copy. And it's 
it's the most severe one because it actually allows you to read the code. Right. And then, I don't know. It is, I mean, that's, that's the only one that's actually introspects code, right? Correct, because the hash is fixed metadata on Metadata of the code, yeah. So I think. I'd say that the, an argument against it is that if, if there is the chance to remove code introspection, i.e. code copy in the future through some kind of migration on legacy contracts, this would make it a lot harder. So I, one, I I would be for I would be for at this stage just uh, code length and have it do what it does at the moment. Mainly because there's so much code in the wild that does that check for is contract, and um, rather than trying to get either change in user behavior or uh solidity to have to interpret what the user is trying to do and change the opcode that it puts out it'd be easier just to support code bank um i put okay, a, I put a link i put a link to open zeppelin's checks and ben what's your opinion on code hash um I mean, it's maybe not harmful. Nobody's nobody's doing anything interesting with code hash, really, either. in terms of, um, be, you know, beyond checking whether it's an empty hash or something else. You're not doing weird maths on it or anything. Because code hash would be useful. We could check empty hash. We could check um, EF00. And also, if, well, you can always escape out to another contract to do the code copy for you. Um, but you could use the hash to prove that you have contract data in memory and extract data from that um, kind of as a proof, but that's kind of a roundabout thing. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's harmful. It's just reading a property of the account, isn't it? Like balance or whatever. Okay. So I'm not hearing strong objections to code size. Kind of lukewarm on code hash. Anyone else got a stronger opinion on either way on that? Yeah, well, I think that... size is going to work with legacy. So it will return real legacy size inside of. Yes. Yeah, just keep it simple. Yeah, so the the two two opcodes would behave unchanged. Yeah, literally, we just leave the restriction of the validation state, and I think the rest is just should work. At least speaking for even one one liner. So one liner for base plus test code. Test code, I think, of course. Yes. I think I think if you reintroduce things like code copy, X code copy, and things, then it you know you're starting to we're starting to box ourselves in in terms of the future. But I don't see any harm with length or hash. So how about we start just, just with hash? And we can think longer about, not a hash, just start with size. And we can think longer with hash. We see what the reaction to this is. But we can always also bring back hash or another detect EOA in a future um, future fork. Okay. So let's let's go on that for now. Here's my screen. So I think the conclusion there.
All right. Next item on the list. Um, it's probably a testing update in 30 minutes. It's probably time to move into testing. Um, Mario, got any info on testing? Anything you want to lead with, or should we just go into the other questions we have? Okay. Uh, Paul, sounds like Mario's uh, muted. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. Um, uh, I did some fuzzing recently, and uh, <clears throat> it's still in progress, uh, but I was able to um, integrate EVM1 and, and REVM. Into into a father and and uh, we starting um, reporting some issues that has been found. What fuzzing framework are you using, and what do other clients need to do to participate? <clears throat> yeah, I'm using I'm using uh, libfuzzer, so it's like coverage based instrumentation uh, for like native code mostly. Um. So I was able to, to get coverage from Rust. I think there's a way to get it from, from Go as well. So I plan to, to start with these three three implementations and for the rest, uh, we'll see. Um, like the basic the basic thing <clears throat> is to just export a C, C kind of function from your implementation. Even if that's without coverage, that, that's also useful. And we can think how to enable coverage later on. Okay, pal. So mostly something your, like static, yeah, something like static library. When you have single single entry point, I can call and that will validate EOF. And I think it's enough to just report true or false for now. So that's that's the, the the basic the basic we can start with. Okay. Um Ben and Eamon is um is producing a static library something that .NET can do in Linux. Uh yes, I think so. Although I need to look into a bit more. Okay, I think there's a way in Java through Graal VM. I found a post that someone did it. Um, as long as we're not testing KZG or BLS um, and speed, performance speed is not a concern. Um, we should be fine there. Um, Graal VM is not the fastest implementation out there. Okay, that, that also like even even before that, um, we can. It exports the all all the all the test cases found so far into JSON, and then you can just <clears throat> run run it from there. Um, so I think so. What I wanted to say, nothing is really needed right now, but in the next one week or two, uh, I might ask some some people from different teams about advice how to integrate that if that's possible and so on. So. Okay. Um, an unrelated approach I was thinking about for fuzzing is if teams exposed T8 and server, or if we fuzzed it through the engine API, but the engine API has got a lot of overhead. Um, or if everyone had ETH simulate, which again has overhead that not everyone implements, but a standard JSON API where if you implement one of the standard JSON APIs, we can fuzz you. Um, that's you know one approach that would make it easier for everyone to come in. The problem with that approach is you can't use coverage to guide the fuzzer. You would need to have the mutations come through separate means. Uh, Mario, you said your mic is working. Do you have any comments you want to add? Hey, thanks. Sorry for the uh, issues. Um, not not that many. Um, I've been working mainly on other uh, PRs, um, but yeah, I agree that we have to do something about fuzzing. We have been trying to implement some kind of fuzzing in, into East, um, but nothing concrete yet. 
um I, I i think i think i think the way to go right now as marius suggested in our core devs is uh fast cbm for the short term but in the long term i would like to for this to be also included in in east um but yeah however i i don't have any solution right now about about fuzzing yet uh but we will start to explore it at least in the following couple of weeks uh to see to see if how we we can implement that in in east um yep um where's what's the does anyone have the i looked at guido's fuzzer it's i want to look at fuzzy vm before we go down guido's too much um guido's got some good hits with fuzzy VM. that's what he's talking about guido's, and vice versa what's the github link to fuzzy vm give me a second i will get it F U Z Z Y V M. That's what it is. There it is. I shared it in in the in the chat. Yeah, it's in Marius's repo. Um, because when you fuzz EOF, you can mute you can mutate an opcode, but that might imply changes in the header, or otherwise it'll fail validation. So we would need to get some more uh changes to the mutation step, but. This gives us something to work with. So the the advantage of East is that it right now it calculates automatically everything that you need for the header to work. Uh, so the max yep. stack height and all that stuff. I think um, it it could be really easy for us to just implement some, some type of fuzzing, but um, it's 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 gonna it's gonna be a little bit a little bit of wait until we finally get it working. Uh, the advantage of Fuzzy VM at the moment is that it already has the the strategies and everything set up, so it's missing some pieces uh, still, in my opinion. Is Fuzzy VM a guided fuzzer, or is it just strictly a random fuzzer based on the strategies, the mutation strategies? I don't think it's guided, but I I, I think Marius should have a better answer. Okay. Because yeah, because if we can get into East, um, then we have a standard interface where everything not guided. Okay, that's actually good to know. Because that was my big panic when I was looking at these fuzzers. Is like Java's got some; it interacts with its uh, tracing APIs, and that's how it gets it guided in VM. Um, but other, I don't know if other languages have live um, coverage of their stats, so we need to do multi-process, which is another complication. But if it's not guided and it's just doing um, intelligent changes. I think moving something like this into East um, opens up that all everyone that can fill tests can be fuzzed. And even the ones that can't fill tests, we could still throw the fixtures at them as they're generated. Let me let me take a look a deeper look into Fuzzy VM this week. And to see how okay. what we can bring into the east world, east world, uh, from from it, um, I will have a better, better context and better opinion uh, next EOF call. Okay. The nice thing is that this is not only beneficial to EF. I think this is an important part of testing that needs to be into into East uh, for yeah for basically every single EIP that we we test for. Yeah, and we're like what we're putting in the East is it's it's a common setup. I got fuzzy working once with Go EVM Lab, and it was not a simple setup, and I'm not even sure I had it set up right in the documentation. Um, if, if, if you understand the tools, the documentation is probably sufficient, but I don't understand the tools. So <laughs> that's probably the problem there is I don't fully understand uh, those two tools. Okay. Um, GOF gas usage of opcodes. Um, we need to get a long-term strategy 
Um, one of the things I mentioned on Discord is, and I'll, I'll probably go ahead and write up a demo of this this week if no one's got it on their plate. Um, but uh, a mutation where we take a legacy call and we call EOF three different times with the change, without the change, and with the change so we can get warm, cold, and non-existent. And that should give us a baseline to figure out what the gas cost of the opcode is. Um, and that way we can make more generic tests out of it. But I would want to mock it up and try it out first. Um, Peter, I see you came off mute. Do you have anything to add to this or comments? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking about this. Um, I'm not sure if you share my uh, reservations with this. I, I guess this would work. It's just, it sounds more like a long-term strategy than short-term, as you said. I wonder what the short-term strategy could be. Just, just to get the, for example, EXT call tests um, in shape in, in uh, East. So mm -hmm. the really and... short-term strategy is to not test it in East, to test it in the fixtures and just make sure we all agree. But that's going to provide really bad metrics when we get it wrong because we have no idea what that's we're getting true. wrong because there's no Fair test enough. explicitly saying you got this wrong. Yeah, I mean, there's there's the the short term strategy which is used in mCopy, memory expansion test at least, which is mm -hmm. just calculate calculate the gas expected gas cost of a you know a particular call by hand and and just assert on that. This is kind of dumb and maybe inelegant. But, but the, the downside, problem. yeah. The, the downside, um, if we don't calculate it independent of an implementation, is we might all collectively get it wrong. Um, and we might change it to the wrong implementation to try and align with other implementations versus coding in the East, we have the correct answer independent of them. So that's, yeah, we, we do need a long-term solution. I mean, the advantage of pre-calculating by hand, right? Yep. Because that's like a another point of reference when it is not calculated by any EVM implementation. It's just calculated by hand. And gas costs aren't like, you know, hashes, which you're not calculating that by hand. Right, right. I mean, the, the downside of the manual approach is, you know, uh, we can get it, we can get the manual calculation wrong but have the right answer right because mm -hmm. you have a lump you have many instructions involved and you just compare the end result and you know you might confuse a i don't know gas cost of a push with something that should cost the same and you know have the right sum and and, and but the wrong pieces yeah and it's ugly and and with the with using the gas opcodes my concerns are it's i mean it, it also doesn't i it, i think it doesn't help with out of gas uh testing right out of gas oh because, uh, yeah except charging the right amount you should also test if if that amount is not supplied then you out of gas at the right moment and sort of the it's called the M copy test style one. Seems to cover both, maybe not ideally, but somewhat. Because in, in this in this style, you just calculate the gas and then you have one case where you supply that amount of gas and the other case when you just subtract one and the subtract one case should fail. And also, I mean, what if I mean, this, this is maybe hypothetical, but what if we want to test EVM implementations we do not, which do not support non-EOF code at all? Then making a long-term strategy using the gas opcode might be a risky. Right, right. That would involve an EST change, though, to run the three tests. Well, figure out what the warm call is. So I think mCopy is a manual calculation. So 
If yeah. you always provide this manual calculation, I mean, it doesn't have to be manual. You have to only provide the formula or the function to get the gas, the gas cost. Um, what we can do is maybe just come up with a decorator for testing um, where you supply which opcode is under test, the formula or the function that is used to calculate the gas, and then it automatically generates these test cases that in, in yeah, the yeah. same fashion as mCopy does right now. Yeah, um, because we, this... we already have three, three opcodes tested like that, which is my shameful addition, which is return uh, something else. And return the copy and also data copy. Just just copy the same, <laughs> the pun intended, non intended. Uh, they, they copy the same approach. So um, we already are at the spot where we, we could make like a mini framework for these kind of tests, but it's, but it's an investment. Yeah, yeah, of course, I understand. Um, let me let me revisit those tests, um, just to get an idea how we can just make a decorator to make it super easy for 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 anyone to just come with the formula and the get and the in the opcode they want to test and then it should automatically produce all the test cases and the advantage of making this a decorator is that if in the future we think of a new test case that applies to every single of these patterns we just have to modify the decorator and the decorator will automatically update Every single test mm -hmm. case where this is applied, and we get we will get new test cases for free. Um, yeah, but yeah, I I need to, I need to take a look just to, to to see how we can design it. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just remember about the quirks in the ext call gas calculation, which might or might not be able to be put into this kind of a decorator approach because then. For ext call, the you have like this. How do you call it? Um, the more gas you supply to a function, the more it changes the the, the way it's distributed for the call. You mean you need to supply this minimum retain re retained gas and also the minimum callie gas, and and then you know this this is this, um, crazy formulas to calculate the expected gas. So I mean just. We need to be wary of this. Yeah, of course. So it needs to be very configurable. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the the base case would be something like M copy. Yeah. But then, yeah, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. if you try to, to to test something more complex that has different like um, uh, levels of, of 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 gas when 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 you go out of gas and something like that, um, you need to be able to configure this also into the decorator. Um, it sounds. Complex, but I, I I would like to see if it's possible to to implement it. Um, yep, I mm -hmm. I will reach out to you. Yeah, uh, uh, if if I have questions about mm -hmm. ESD call. Yep. Yeah, yeah, please do. I'm not sure about the long term start strategy though. Though do we do we do this gas uh, harness or or trace testing, which also popped up. So if you have any thoughts on that, um, you can also um, let us know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. I think that's uh, probably need to time box the fuzzing if we want to get to our last subject, uh, which is the subject of DevCon talks. Um, do we want to collaborate? Who's submitting? What spaces do we want to make sure is covered? Um, I submitted one talk with uh, a future of EOF talking about capabilities and some of the e e extravagant things that might be added that are enabled by the container. Um, but I haven't submitted any other talks and I want to hear what other people are submitting to make sure that we have the coverage and people who are willing to go and willing to talk. So make sure we get enough coverage for this. Uh, Peter, you came up mute briefly. Oh, uh, nope. Just gone on yet. Okay. So um who's planning to go to DevCon and take that long flight? And even if you're not, what talks do you think we need to have coverage for?
should we have an EOF panel? And if so, who should we invite and who should moderate? I mean, as it, um, I don't know if it's premature, but we're sort of thinking about uh, the way to structure the EOF related talks. Mm. But I'm not really involved in this, so maybe someone else can can speak. Let me see. There's Alex is not here. Yeah, Eamon raised his hand. Um, Dragon had bad luck with the visa. Do you think you'll have better luck with the Thai visa? Uh, should be easier. Uh, to be honest about talks right to EF, um, I didn't thought about that a lot. Uh, having like panels seems maybe it's the best option. Uh, yeah, we should have few talks, but having a panel additionally seems okay. Especially because the people don't know what the OF is, they tie it to one thing, like it's performance and why we are doing 10% performance. So there is a lot of confusion related to UF. We need to somehow make it clearer in some way, in form or form. Okay. So would this be like a history of the EVM and how we got to EOF? Would that be like the guide for that panel? Yeah, that could be nice. Uh, the the frame, frame that we want to get is basically, hey, every change that you are making around the OF are basically the minimal set that we have. We cannot like remove things from it. And we thought a lot what needs to be included and what needs to be added at this point of time. Yeah. Or some version of that. Okay. Does anyone want to volunteer to be on a panel? I would volunteer. I could do that. Do I need to go? Okay. I honestly think we should get Greg or Boris. If Greg's going, Greg's probably not going. It's I don't know if Boris Mann is going. Um, happy to uh, I think we need some... work with you, Dano, uh, and huh? try to look for. Happy to work with you and try to add more people on the panel. Uh, but for that, we may have to make an application for that. Would you be willing to make the application for uh, the panel discussion, or do you want us to take care of that? I can take the panel application. I just want to know who I should list to be on the panel. Who okay. uh, Getting feedback on that. Um, I think we should have someone from EVM1. Um, and the reason... I feel that is because they've been one of the longer term um, developers, longer than me, um, is as far as getting stuff working on the EVM. And they also have, I think the biggest thing we can get from someone from Team Epsilon is um, feedback on what happened during EWASM and um, how that informed where we got to. But I'll, I'll ping the Epsilon team separately on that. Are there any other... I guess one question, do we want to have it be, um, do we want to have a skeptic on the panel? And if so, who? And how should we handle it? Or should it just be a, a history in a, in a pro EOF panel? It's hard to plan at this point because that's... <laughs> Will it still be in come November, honestly? I mean, yes. <laughs> Just more in, hopefully. Let's so then I'm... To address the elephant in the room. <laughs> okay. uh, we can well, always but... ask. You can always ask Marius. He was mostly like voicing out his opinion about UF. Right. And that. So Marius is probably a good is... one to ask. Yeah. 
and and this is like three months and a lot of things can change in three months opinions can right. shift right it can be also uh, Martin and uh, because I think he had some also some criticism recently yeah Marius or Martin okay because I do want to get you know the 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 skeptical side on it, but I also don't want it to turn into a forty minute debate about the legitimacy of EOF. So we'll need to make sure that whoever we get to moderate will will keep that in mind. And that's the next question: is who do we ask to moderate? I mean, maybe I moderate. I don't know. A journalist would be nice, but I don't know which one. Okay. Um. Anything anyone wants to discuss before we end the meeting? Tim would be interesting. I will ask Tim. He might be too busy, but I think it's worth the ask. Um, anything else that anyone wants to talk about before we end the call? All right. Um, if you have any other comments, uh, the Discord's always open. Feel free to ask anything. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the time spent working on AOF and coming on this call. And we'll see everyone in the next meeting.